All right, let's take a quick look at the ribbon microphone and its transducer. All right, well, on first inspection, basically, you can get a pretty easy look that, you know, you've got some corrugated looking kind of metal that's between two poles of a magnet, um, and it's going to a transformer. Well, obviously, that's not going to work like a dynamic microphone. And if you look at different configurations of it, you know, it seems to be a reoccurring fact that you've got this corrugated metal between the different poles of a magnet that seem to be most of the time connected together somehow. Some of them are not in some of the different types of ribbon microphones. But the basic concept seems to be fairly, fairly, you know, uniform that this is the basic concept of what's happening there. So I guess we need to have a little bit better understanding of what exactly that means. Okay, so they say the principle of operation, or let's read this. In a moving coil microphone like the dynamic microphone we looked at, the diaphragm is attached to a light movable coil that generates a voltage as it moves back and forth between the poles of a permanent magnet. We've already discussed that and understand that fairly well. In ribbon microphones, a light metal ribbon is suspended between the poles of a magnet, as you see here. As the ribbon vibrates, a voltage is induced at right angles to both the ribbon velocity and magnetic field direction and is picked off by contacts at the ends of the ribbon. Ribbon microphones are also called velocity microphones because the induced voltage is proportional to the velocity of the ribbon and thus of the air particles in the sound wave, unlike in some other microphones where the voltage is proportional to the displacement of the diaphragm and the air, like we were talking about in dynamic microphones. So basically what is happening there? The basic understanding of what's happening there is you've got a lead coming off one side and off the other side of it. And it, these two, these two, uh, these two magnets are different poles, magnetic poles and different polarities. So basically what's happening as the sound wave hits that, it causes it to vibrate. So instead of it working like a dynamic microphone, what is happening is the actual velocity of the impact and the movement of this between the two poles rather than going up and down like a diaphragm the actual velocity the actual electromagnetic inductance like we talked about in dynamic microphone is being induced a little bit differently by the actual speed of it vibrating back and forth between those two poles the faster it's moving then the higher the actual voltage that gets pushed through the circuit so that's a real simple way to look at it. We won't get into the real technical aspects of what that means because it can be a little technical, but that's a real simple way to understand it. And the only other thing we really want to understand, um, because we want to keep that very simple in our head for the applications we're using. We don't want, I mean, you can get into it and understand it in depth if you want, but for our just to understanding, so as we go through this series, that's basically what we need to understand as that velocity is moving it so that we can apply all the other things we've talked about, all the other concepts from the other transducers to this transducer also, but understand that it's based on the velocity of it going back and forth, and it's not work. It's working along the same lines of the electromagnetic induction of the dynamic microphone, except for it's moving back and forth between the actual poles, not touching them, and its velocity is actually causing the, the electromagnetic induction and a higher voltage as the actual velocity increases from from it moving back and forth and we'll try to keep it that simple so we for now uh, we're, the next thing we need to understand is that there's another part after it comes off these leads what's going on there the other thing we're looking at is on the ends of these two leads they're hitting a transformer what they call a step up transformer and all that's doing is trying to increase the voltage because of the low output voltage caused by the electromagnetic induction here that the voltage is so small that it's very hard to read and be usable so there's a step up trans transformer here that actually you know increases the voltage so that it's more usable so it's a higher voltage that you can actually be read well and they also say a lot of times nowadays that the magnets are good enough nowadays that they don't need them that there's no even need for this step up transformer because of the quality of the magnets and the material of the ribbon here 
is well enough to where you know, the transformer isn't need to increase the voltage so that it can be read well. Um, that's pretty easy to understand. So what else we need to look at? The other thing to understand about this transducer is normally the polar pattern is basically that it's got two directions. So from the front or back, it gets it picks up equally. And in some of the microphones, they'll actually enclose one side. They'll enclose one side so that only from the front that it can, you know, read, you know, information or actually be, you know, actually, you know, convert and transduce from one direction rather than both directions. So that's a, a very pertinent piece of information. One other piece of information about the actual, the ribbon inside of it can be very delicate. So anytime any strong gust of wind or a percussion impacts on it directly can actually damage it. Nowadays they're really working at it to where that it's pretty stable and solid. But some of the other stuff was so thin that it was like, you know, like a, a hair is 100 microns thick. Well, the actual thickness of that ribbon might be 1.2 microns. I mean, that's just giving an example of how thin it is. And that just breathing on it, some of them too hard, can actually destroy them or damage them. So nowadays they're working on materials to take care of that problem. But a lot of times if you're dealing with direct, anything very strong, percussive, is to actually angle it. Because the more that it's angled, the less direct impact on the ribbon and the less chance of it to actually hurt it. And actually... Having it faced, you know, if you got an impact coming this way and you got the ribbon microphone laid down flat, that actually it going over the top of it can take a lot of impact and capture the sound without actually hurting the ribbon. But most of the time at degrees of different angles, so that it's not a direct impact on the ribbon because that's a huge thing to take into consideration because you can actually really damage that microphone um, with, you know, just, you know, with, with plosives from your voice or from impacts from percussion instruments. All right, the other thing that we come to that I dug around on some sites trying to find out about materials. Um, we have the same problem with materials and configurations of any type of diagrams for electronics as we did with any, well, any of the other transducers. So basically that, you know, you want to look at the spectra, at the specs and refer back to the things that we've already talked about at the beginning of this series to better understand properties of that microphone. We're going to talk more about uses of the microphone and what and different types of microphone and bet what what ones are better for what uses and things like that. But as far as the materials and really getting scientific understanding of that, I hope that you know you've watched all the other videos that especially the one we did on dynamic microphones because we really addressed it there that basically that we're going to run into a huge problem with understanding what the materials are, what the exact tolerances are, um, you know, and we already I've talked about the problems with any time we're talking about any electronic configurations inside the microphone of how that can be better and the problems we can run into there that may be very specific. Even if they look the same and we have a better, we have a fairly good understanding of what's happening there, that because of the mirror materials or configuration or what they might be trying to do or the tolerances, that there can be a lot of problems that basically that those schematics can do us absolutely no good without tearing the microphone apart and actually testing everything inside there. So we're, we've already learned not to go there yet. Unless we're actually building the microphone, which if we have that type of knowledge, we would. And we're going to talk about that towards the end of the series. So basically, you know, we'll come to the same problem. We understand the transducer. We understand what it's doing. We understand how it's producing the voltage. And we've got a, you know, a fairly good understanding of what's happening there in layman's terms. Um, you know, like with all the transducers, I very much say go back, you know, and, you know, read about electromagnetic conduction and have a really good understanding. The better you, you understand those things, the better. But, you know, if you're working in the studio, I, I don't know how far you want to take that. You know, I don't know if you want to become a complete audio engineer, you know, to record music. So you have to make your decision how far you want to go with that. But just understanding how the transducer works and understanding the electronic components, the same as we understand any of the other electronic components, is what are they trying to do with the electronic components in that microphone? And, and how could they be different from Bob's? If they're doing something special, then you can probably get the diagram from them and say, well, what's going on in there? And then you look at the specs and anything that might be different from a comparable different microphone that's not doing that or is trying to do the same thing and act, ask direct questions to the manufacturer. I mean, send them emails and bug them, you know, I want some wiring diagrams and why is it doing that? You know, it, it might take some time, but you might get some real good information that may not help you in tearing the microphone apart, 
but when you go to use it you might be able to compensate for things differently if some microphones are reacting to sound differently because of part of its components but just like everything else we're talking about the transducer and that this transducer that ribbon that they've made out of what i don't know they've made out of what type of magnet i mean a lot of that stuff's going to be trade secrets again and same with the wiring diagram they might not want to tell you where they get their components what exactly they use because they don't want bob to have it so he can make it for four dollars in china you know with all due respect i don't mean no disrespect but does that make sense so you know that's the issue we're coming to now so i think we understand the transducer and those things we've already addressed fairly well um the only other the only other things that we need to talk about now is the next part in the series well as far as this tra transducer we understand how that transducer works we understand that basically electronic components we're going to run into the same problem as we do with any of them is you know how much do you understand audio engineering and you know what's it doing to the actual sound what you look at the specs and then you can start looking into that more and i say that as you're searching around for microphones that as you find in microphones with the specs that you want with the applications you're looking for then you can start digging in a little bit deeper to what's actually going on in the actual circuitry and the diaphragm and the actual transducer to see which one might push you over the edge to buy this one or that one but you might have some difficulties getting that information and even if you can get that information you might have some mathematical scientific physical uh, you know uh, limitations to how much you're going to be able to understand that to make a decision of which one's better be because of you know how close you are to an actual audio engineer may limit your ability to make a concrete decision and you might have to fall back again on you know the specifications and the knowledge of the things we've already talked about which is more likely going to happen anyway um, you know, unless you really get into it really deep and become an actual audio engineer and understand that Bob here put this resistor here and that screwed the whole damn thing up as far as you're concerned and you would have wired it differently and used a different transistor and everything would have been fine. You know what I'm saying? So, and it can be that simple sometimes, you know, and if you don't understand that, that there's really, you're not going to get anywhere there without that understanding. So let's, you know, we understand that transducer fairly well. And let's go ahead and move on to understanding what different microphones might be used for and where their strengths and weaknesses are and take a little look at that because that way we can apply that information to the other things we've talked about to help guide us in what kind of transducer and microphone that we might be using for different type of specific applications. So I hope you understand, you understand this transducer a little bit better, understand its basic function and how it functions and it helps you to make your decision more about this transducer. I'll see you in the next video when we talk about different microphones and different applications for them. Peace, hope, love.